Mike, we've been on a bit of a dark streak in recent episodes. Yeah, I mean, episodes with Area 51 and Jack the Ripper and a touch on serial killers. It's been tough stuff. The scourge of toilet paper orientation. Yep, another one to add to the list, probably the most contentious. So why don't we, uh, why don't we switch gears? Uh, we'll take a harsh left turn today and talk about food trucks. You're really cooking up the puns. I'm trying my best. Food trucks are pretty much what they sound like. It's a large vehicle equipped to cook and sell food, and they're part of a busy street food industry that serves an estimated 2.5 billion people every day. Some, including ice cream trucks, sell frozen or prepackaged food. Others have onboard kitchens and prepare food from scratch. Stuff like sandwiches, hamburgers, french fries, and some other regional fast food fare is typically common. In recent years, associated with the pop-up restaurant phenomenon, food trucks offering gourmet cuisine and a wide range of internationally themed menus have become particularly popular. And while food trucks may be trendy right now, they actually date back a couple of hundred years. If we go back to the 1800s, you would find something called a chuck wagon, which was a covered wagon train as people traveled west across North America. They were used to feed ranchers, cowboys, loggers, and more. So imagine this almost convoy of food-related automobiles powered (laughs) by horses, I'm assuming, uh, going across the deserts. Yeah, it's like the game Oregon Trail, but for snacks. Oregano Trail. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) The credit for inventing the chuck wagon goes to Charles Goodnight of Texas. After the American Civil War, ranchers working in the growing American beef market would need to live out in these remote areas for months at a time, and Goodnight had a way to keep them fed. He modified durable army surplus wagons to include what he called the chuck box to the back of the wagon. This stand-up cabinet came complete with drawers and shelves for storage space and a hinged lid when folded down, providing a flat cooking surface. A water barrel was also attached to the wagon and a canvas was hung underneath to carry firewood. That sounds like a pretty smart invention, but what kind of food could you even keep in a wagon out in the middle of nowhere, Texas? Well, there were staple foods like beans and salted meats and coffee that could be stored for long periods of time. However, of course, no fruit, vegetables, or eggs were available unless they could be collected in the nearby wilderness. Before we get back to food trucks, I do want to mention there's this whole community of people today surrounding these old chuck wagons. Members of the American Chuck Wagon Association challenge each other in cook-offs, which are judged on the authenticity of the wagon and the food prepared using it. Wagons must, of course, be in drivable condition, outfitted with equipment and contents available in the late 1800s, and get this, even the attire of the cooks goes into the final grade. Well, of course. I mean, you need the authenticity, right? That's right. And I kind of love that this is still happening, but what I really love is that chuck wagon racing can still be found in Western (laughs) Canada. Chuck wagons are raced around a figure-eight barrel obstacle course, and the stove and temp poles within the wagon must not be lost during the race. Of course. The racing team also has from two to four outriders who load the stove and temp poles at the start and must finish the race with the chuck wagon as well. I know what I'm doing with my summer break. Indeed. Between the chuck wagon and today... We do have something else called the lunch wagon. In 1872, a man named Walter Scott cut windows in a small covered wagon, parked it in front of a newspaper office in Providence, Rhode Island, and sold sandwiches, pies, and coffee to journalists. By the 1880s, Thomas Buckley was manufacturing lunch wagons in New England. He sold various models. He had a whole line of these things. And some of them included sinks, refrigerators, and cooking stoves. Fancy. Then, of course, you have mobile canteens, which were created in the late 1950s and used by the U.S. military both abroad and stateside on army bases. I actually was watching Great British Bake Off recently, and they were showing these things where, like, they would have these wagons or these cars, right? These almost trucks that were in the Second World War, and they had, like, donuts and stuff. Um, it was it was look around kind of cool just to keep keep the American soldiers happy. So there you go. There you go. Uh, this episode is brought to you by our friends at Casper, the company focused on sleep, dedicated to making you exceptionally comfortable one night at a time. You spend a third of your life sleeping, so don't you want it to be the best it can possibly be? Well, that's why you need a Casper mattress. All of Casper's mattresses are perfectly designed for humans with engineering to soothe and support your natural geometry. They do this by combining multiple supportive memory foams for a quality 
quality mattress with just the right sink and bounce, and their breathable design helps to regulate your body temperature throughout the night. With over 20,000 reviews and an average rating of 4.8 stars, Casper is very clearly becoming the internet's favorite mattress. You can be sure of your purchase with Casper's 100-night risk-free sleep-on-it trial. They'll deliver directly to your door, and if for any reason you do not love your Casper mattress, they have a hassle-free return policy. You can get $50 towards select mattress purchases by going to casper.com slash ungeniest and using the code ungenius at checkout. Terms and conditions apply. That is casper.com slash ungeniest and the offer code ungenius. We thank Casper for their support of this show. Okay, let's make it back to modern food trucks. For decades, food trucks were mostly spotted in areas where their owners could serve meals to blue-collar workers during their lunch breaks. Nicknames like roach coaches or gut trucks didn't really help their public appearance, but I think kind of described the quality of the food that you would get in them at the time. I think so. Over time, food trucks began to spread into more cities around the world, serving quick, cheap food to those on the go. But in the last decade or so, like we've been talking about, they've really become more popular in America and parts of Europe. In fact, in the U.S. alone, food trucks are estimated to be a $1.2 billion industry. Today, food trucks are being hired for events like weddings, corporate gatherings, church picnics, food truck rodeos, or they're even just kind of, I mean, we have these in London, you'll have these places that you can go to and they're like permanently stationed and rotating so you can try out different food there. On August 31st, 2013... Tampa, Florida, hosted the world's largest food truck rally at the time, with 99 trucks and hundreds of customers in attendance. I can't even picture that. Like, 99 food trucks? This go- goes on forever. <laughs> I feel like you could get you could get like a real taste of the world or something like that. Sounds like fun. Oh, yeah. Tracking food trucks has been made a lot easier now with social media. Now a person can see where their favorite truck is with just a few taps. I know the ones here in Memphis have like these super over-the-top Instagram accounts where they're sharing stuff just all the time. Yep. Modern food trucks often focus on a limited number of menus but have become increasingly specialized. We have one here. All they serve is different types of grilled cheese sandwiches. We have those in London, too. Everyone loves a grilled cheese. (laughs) As food trucks have seen their popularity rise, operators have had to navigate multiple hurdles. In addition to the regular permits and health codes normal restaurants have to meet, there are also specialized driver's licenses and operational permits needed to manage the fact that the restaurant is also, well, a van or a truck. (laughs) You have both. (laughs) Then there's the legal side of things. Chicago long held the distinction of being the only city in the United States of America that did not allow food trucks to cook on board, which required trucks to prepare food in a commercial condition, wrap it, label the food, and load it into a food warmer, which would be kept on the truck. That changed in 2012, but now food trucks are required to park 200 feet away from any restaurant, virtually eliminating busy downtown locations. Sometimes these restrictions are of a political nature, but sometimes there are health issues to consider. Some food trucks do not have access to adequate clean and hot water necessary to wash hands or to rinse off vegetables as required by most health codes or regulations, for example. In June 2017, the Boston Globe launched an investigation into the city's food trucks. It reviewed the 2016 city health records and found food trucks had been cited for violations 200 times, and about half of those were serious violations. When compared to fixed location restaurants, the city closed nine of the 96 licensed food trucks in 2016 and closed only two out of 100 restaurants. A majority of the serious violations were related to the lack of water and hand washing available. Before we wrap this up, there is one specific type of food truck we need to talk about. The ice cream truck. Known as ice cream vans here in the UK, they're often seen parked at public events or near parks, beaches, or other areas where people congregate. They're also well known for traveling through areas where there are children, like near schools and residential areas like suburbs. We have an ice cream truck that goes down our streets constantly. Any any time of the year, which I don't fully understand. I remember hearing that song playing as the van turned the corner onto the street I grew up on and the inevitable denial of ice cream by my mother. That makes me a little sad to hear, but I can understand why she said no. Ice cream vans, of course, mark up store-bought ice cream cones quite frequently and other treats to resell. Nicer vans may have soft-serve machines on board, though, so you can get a real nice soft ice cream. Now I really feel robbed. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> The business of ice cream vans can be very dependent on weather. A summer heat wave can lead to an uptick in business, 
But after the weather has turned mild again, sales can drop off dramatically. Like food trucks, ice cream van operators can face stiff regulation. For example, in some London boroughs with existing street markets available, street trading regulations prohibit ice cream vans from remaining in a static location, so they have to move around a lot. This legislation can also be used to ban ice cream vans from specific streets or areas. It's a hard world out there, Mike. A cold, hard world. Well, if you have the right equipment, it could be a cold soft world as well. <laughs> so that's the history and, and present of food trucks. There you go. Sometime I want to tell you about my theory of how I believe the ice cream vans uh, carry drugs for drug trafficking, but we can leave that for another episode. I think we could just do it right now. That sounds incredible. <laughs> All right. So I have a theory, right? Oh, no. Uh, when you hear ice cream vans in the winter... Mm. what are they doing right and i hear them quite a lot you'll hear an ice cream van come down the street and it's playing its jingle and it's winter and it's like well what is what are they selling and who are they selling it to and then i think to myself well one way to sell drugs could be from a from an ice cream van right because there's it's just a cash related business you're already moving around you're in a moving vehicle so pe- like you won't like people won't maybe think that it's out of place or weird because everyone knows what the ice cream van is anyway it goes from place to place delivering drugs to people that need it that is my theory i believe uh, and if, if ice cream van operators are not doing this i would be surprised and maybe they should look <laughs> into it i don't know i mean if That's you were going to sell drugs illegal mm-hmm. drugs mm-hmm I feel like it'd be really easy for the police to catch you if your van literally played music as it drove down the road. (laughs) Right, but it's a perfect cover, though, right? Because they already have a reason to be there. They already have a reason for people to come up to them. And, like, you could could put the drugs in the cone, right, and just put ice cream on the top. You've thought a lot about this. Maybe more than I should. (laughs) I'm severely implicating myself at this point. Yeah, right. Mike's looking for vans on Craigslist. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine, for the topic this week. Another one that was way more interesting than I than I thought it would be. They always are, Stephen. They always are. It's true. If you want to read about food trucks or chuck wagons or ice cream vans, uh, there's some links in the show notes. You can find those this week at relay.fm slash ungenius slash 55. You can get in touch with us there as well. There's an email link. But you can also hit us up on Twitter. The show is at ungenius. A bunch of show topics come through Twitter, so send us your favorite weird Wikipedia topics. You can follow Mike there, and you should because Mike's awesome. You can find him on Twitter as I-M-Y-K-E, and he hosts a bunch of shows at relay.fm slash shows. Uh, And you can find me on Twitter as ISMH. And until our next rolling ice cream headache, Mike, say goodbye. Goodbye. Adios.